This case takes us to Stellenbosch, South Africa, a picturesque town surrounded by vineyards and mountains located 31 miles east of Cape Town. It's a small town with a population of about 20,000 people, and one of its residents was 22-year-old Inga Lutz. On March 16, 2005, Inga Lutz was found dead in her high-security apartment, demonstrating once again that we are never truly safe. Keep watching to learn how the police's negligence resulted in a miscarriage of justice. Inga Lutz was born on March 9, 1983, and was the only child of Jan and Juanita Lutz. She grew up in a tight-knit family and resided in a wealthy neighborhood of Welgimode. Those who knew Inga described her as talented, vivacious, attractive, and having a contagious smile. She was also a talented pianist and soprano singer. She excelled in sports and received many academic achievement awards. When the time came for Inga to attend university, she chose to major in mathematics. She was, as expected, an excellent student. Inga continued to study after finishing her bachelor's degree and by 2005, she was well on her way to getting her master's degree in mathematical statistics. It was at this time in 2004 that Inga met 22-year-old Fred Van de Verver, a fellow actuarial science student. Fred grew up on a thriving tomato and cattle farm in Eastern Cape and attended Gray College, a prominent boarding school. He was not only gifted academically, but was also an accomplished athlete, having played rugby, cricket, and tennis. Fred drew Inga's attention with his height, dark complexion, and good looks. They began dating and was smitten from day one. Inga's parents not only approved of the relationship, but they also adored Fred and accepted him into the family. Inga's mother later said Inga wanted to marry Fred. Fred was still taking classes at the university after finishing his postgraduate degree and starting his career. He had a promising position as an actuary at Old Mutual, a well-known South African financial and insurance firm based in Cape Town. In 2005, he moved into an apartment close to his work with his friend and classmate, Maurice Bolta. Inga moved into her own apartment at the end of February 2005 in the Shireh Security Complex on the outskirts of Stellenbosch. It was a new development with some units still under construction. The apartment was only a 30-minute drive from her parents' house in Welgemode. Like many gated communities, the complex had a remote control access high security gate and high walls with barbed and electric wires. Fred went to Inga's apartment on Tuesday with the intention of staying the night. He had a lecture the next morning and Inga's house was closer to the university than his. On March 16th, Inga and Fred were having breakfast together when a huge argument broke out between them. Inga felt something was up with Fred because they'd been acting cranky and irritable for a few days. She asked Fred if it had anything to do with their relationship. Fred first refused to talk about it, but later revealed that his earlier disagreement with his older brother had upset him. Inga didn't believe him and burst into tears, asking him whether he still loved her. Fred told her that he did, but he felt that Inga was unsure about their relationship. Inga stated that she still had feelings for him, and Fred suggested that she write down her thoughts in a letter or email so they could discuss it later. He had to leave for a lecture and left at 7.45 a.m. Things were still a little hazy between the two. Inga wrote Fred a two-page letter while he was attending his lecture. She texted him at 9.40 a.m. saying she was going to have to go to college to deliver the letter. Around this time, a tiling contractor arrived at Inga's door to arrange for the repair of two broken tiles on her balcony. But Inga had to leave and asked if he could return later. Inga was waiting for Fred when he exited his lecture hall on campus at 10 a.m. and they parted ways after she handed him the note in an envelope. After giving Fred the letter, Inga attended a class and had an early lunch with her childhood friend Wimpy Boshoff. Wimpy would be the last friend of Inga to see her alive. At 1.36 p.m., Inga sent a final message to Fred. Had a nice visit with Wimpy. Tiles have been laid. Miss you already. At 2.55 p.m., a receipt shows that Inga purchased a burger from Steers and then walked to a nearby grocery store to buy a magazine and a soda. She then walked to a DVD rental shop, where she rented to Stepford Wives at 3.07 p.m. This was the last recorded activity of Inga Lutz. 
safety is a top concern in South Africa, as it has one of the highest crime rates in the world. And that was on Fred's mind on the evening of March 16th, after he tried to phone Inga, but she didn't pick up. Inga was not the type to ignore phone calls or text messages. At 10 p.m., Fred texted Inga's mother, explained that he couldn't reach Inga. He asked if Juanita had heard from her as he had become concerned. Juanita responded by saying she had not heard from her daughter since lunchtime. At 10.30 p.m., Fred made one final attempt at reaching his girlfriend before telling his friend Morris he was going to drive to her apartment to do a welfare check. Morris suggested they ask a mutual friend named Christo Pistorius to go to her apartment and check on her instead. Meanwhile, Fred could drive to Inga's mother's house to get her spare keys. When the friend, Christo Pistorius, went to Inga's apartment complex and pressed the doorbell at the security gate, he received no response. Concerned, he asked a neighbor waiting on his balcony to open the gate. Christo knocked on Inga's door several times before trying the doorknob and, much to his surprise, it was unlocked. He stepped inside, calling her name. He could see into the living room through the entrance door and what he saw shocked him. Inga was seated erect on her couch. Her head and face were severely bludgeoned. She was almost unrecognizable. Christo immediately called the police and then told Morris what he saw. Inga had been brutally bludgeoned in the head with what forensic experts believed was a hammer, then stabbed multiple times in the neck and body. An autopsy revealed she had been struck up to 47 times. The killer had then used her bathroom to clean up, leaving a bloody towel on the floor and blood spatter on the sink, as well as a single bloody shoe print on the bathroom floor. From the start, police suspected that the crime was done by someone Inga knew well. The only way anyone could have entered her apartment was if she had let them in. She was also dressed in pajama shorts and a tank top and she would not have likely felt comfortable in front of just anyone dressed like this. It had to be someone she felt at peace with. Furthermore, there were no signs of a struggle and no valuables had been stolen. The police believed that the murder was committed by someone who was personally enraged with Inga at the time. They classified it as a crime of passion. About two weeks after the incident, Werner Corliss, a 17-year-old notorious criminal and meth user, admitted to killing Inga then, he revised his story, saying he saw the murder, which was perpetrated by his friend. Corollas claimed they murdered a young woman who bought drugs from them on a Saturday night. He waited outside to keep an eye on things before noticing his friends leave the area. He then saw Inga on the couch, blood flowing from her arm through the window. This account made very little sense. For starters, Inga was not a drug user. She was also murdered on a Wednesday, not on a Saturday and there was no blood trickling from Inga's arm at the crime scene. When the police took Carlos to Inga's neighborhood, he pointed out Shires, the complex where Inga resided, but he couldn't specify where her apartment was in the complex. Carolus eventually recanted his confession, claiming it was all made up. Then the fingerprints analysis results arrived. There was a print matching that of Inga's boyfriend, Fred, on a generic DVD cover on the coffee table, which placed him at the location after she had rented the DVD at 3.07 p.m. when Fred claimed to be at work. Following this, a search warrant for Fred's apartment was issued. A search of his apartment turned up a sports shoe that matched the blood mark on the crime scene's bathroom floor. The high-tech brand sneakers had just been cleaned. When Fred was asked if he had a hammer, he remembered a decorative hammer slash bottle opener that Inga's parents had given him for Christmas. The words, Fred 2004, were inscribed on the silver handle. The hammer was behind the driver's seat in Fred's car. He said that it had slipped beneath his seat and that he'd forgotten about it. In June, two months after Inga Lutz's death, authorities were preparing to arrest her boyfriend, Fred. Fred went to the Clotusville police station and surrendered while maintaining his innocence. On the advice of his lawyers, he asked to take a polygraph test, which he passed with flying colors. However, the prosecution believed that their evidence against Fred was solid enough. They were assembling evidence and witness statements for presentation at trial. From the onset, it looked like they had their guy. After two long years, the trial of Fred Van Der Veer began. The trial would last nine months. The fingerprint on the DVD case was the first piece of evidence, indicating that Fred arrived at the crime site after 3 p.m. 
an American fingerprint specialist analyzed the data and determined that the print in question originated from a curved surface, like a glass, rather than a flat surface, like a DVD case. That suggested the evidence was labeled incorrectly. It would be natural to find Fred's fingerprints on a glass, given that he spent a lot of time at the apartment, including the night before the murder. To make matters worse, police returned the DVD cover to the video place, where Inga had rented the film, sacrificing an important, possibly the most important piece of evidence in this case. The trial was just one litany of bizarre mistakes that would be revealed. Starting the moment the police were called, there were seven officers inside the apartment, compromising the entire crime scene. In terms of the murder weapon, Fred's ornate hammer did not contain Inga's DNA. The shape of the head wounds did not correspond to the shape of the hammer. The victim could have been pistol whipped, according to the defense, because the wounds were greater than the shape of the ornamental hammer. Then there were the evidence of shoe prints. According to South African Police Investigator Superintendent Bruce Barlow Mew, ex-FBI Bill Baziek, who literally authored the textbook on blood evidence and shoe prints, verified to the court that the blood imprint in the bathroom was formed by Fred's shoe. However, Bruce had lied about that statement. It was Fred's defense team that called Bill Baziak as an expert witness. Bill testified that the blood mark in the restroom was not Fred's. In fact, it was not a shoe print at all. There was also the fact that the police never questioned the construction workers and the tilers, the last person to have seen Inga. Soon afterwards, the construction company was liquidated and all the illegal workers returned to Mozambique, becoming untraceable. Finally, in November of 2007, Fred Van de Verver was acquitted of the murder of Inga Lutz. During his closing arguments, Judge Dion Van Ziel stated that he had never witnessed such a lack of police discipline at a crime scene. He felt sympathetic to Inga's family, adding that it is natural for the community to want someone held accountable when a beautiful, brilliant young person is murdered. The court, however, could only reach a decision based on the evidence offered. The case of Inga Lutz is sad, and we can only hope that her parents and loved ones get the closure they deserve.